Hey everybody, Cole here with Classic Mini DIY, and yes, if you guys haven't seen already, I have shaved. I decided to shave it all off, start fresh, for no shave November, I think I'm gonna grow a big beard. Uh, I don't know, we'll see. But yeah, I've shaved. Yes, I know, it's different. But I'm excited to tell you guys that I am getting back to the early 998 engine, which is here in front of me. This is the remote transmission that's gonna go on it. And on today's episode, my plan is to paint this sucker. So the plan today is to mask this sucker off, cover up our valve assembly here, cover up parts that we don't wanna get painted. And we're gonna clean everything up, get all the oily residue off of this thing. We gotta prep it really nice for the paint. Obviously you can see there's primer on it already. Um, the machine shop did that for me. Thank you so much to them. But after we get it all prepped, we're gonna spray this sucker down get it nice and green, and the paint I'm using is actually the Factory Original Classic Color. It's a, it's a, uh, it's a paint line that Moss Motors makes, um, and this is the Sprite Midget Enamel Engine Green, um, which is the same green that would be on the Mini. Now, something I do want to mention is that the original engines, these early 998s, they came out of the factory completely green, the whole thing like literally top to bottom. Um, the valve cover, all of it was green. So this beautiful aluminum transmission is going to have to get painted as well. Now, since this is a period rebuild, I am going to be doing that. I'm gonna be painting the whole thing green. I am gonna leave some little things out like the engine studs to add a little bit of contrast, some of the fittings on the front, um, but otherwise this thing is gonna become completely green and I think it's gonna look really good. This, uh, this classic color, if you guys wanna pick this up, Seven Mini Parts carries this. Uh, the link to this is in the description. Um, you can also find this I'm sure that the mini part suppliers overseas also carry this if it's something you're looking for. Um, but I've used it before, it works really, really well. Um, you guys might remember the early 998 that I did. Same paint, same use, really just turned out nicely. Um, but as you can imagine, the key to a good paint job is prep. Um, so that is what I'm going to do here. You guys don't have to sit through all of that. I'm gonna give you a quick little time lapse and we'll get through all that prep work and then we'll move outside and, uh, and paint the sucker. So let's get to it. All right, so now that everything is painted, I'm gonna show you guys why I really, really like to uh, tape off the ARP head studs um, and cover this up. Um, as you can see, this is a valve cover that is obviously not gonna go on this engine. Um, this is my paint valve cover. It used to look really nice, and then this paint started to chip off, so I got rid of this off of my car, and it's become kind of the sacrificial valve cover at this point. Um, but the nice thing is, is I can use it to tape off, effectively tape off the uh, valve assembly so that you don't end up painting all that. Next, we'll go ahead and take out this rag. Go ahead and start removing. Of course, that would happen. All of our tape here. Now, see what I mean? 
That looks so good with these black head studs nice and exposed like that. Um, I'm not gonna put the normal valve cover, the one that's actually gonna go on here, I'm not gonna put that on yet. Uh, I have a special surprise for that one, so I'm gonna leave that out for now. Um, but we can go ahead and start removing the tape on everything else. That really came out nicely. I hope you guys can, uh, I hope you guys think that that looks good too. Um, it is gonna look really nice assembled. Whoever gets this is really gonna, really gonna like this engine. Now, one thing I do after I paint is, uh, the paint is still a little tacky. So what I'll do is I'm gonna chase all these threads just so that the threads aren't caked with paint or anything. Um, one thing that you can do is put a set of spark plugs in the engine um, to paint it. You know, if you have like an old set of spark plugs, they're good to keep around because you can effectively block out these holes. Um, in my case, I didn't have any lying around, surprisingly. So, they got a little paint in there, but it's no biggie. Even if you left the paint there, it probably wouldn't hurt it. Um, it's just gonna burn off. So, engine block is pretty much prepped here. Um, this has been ready for a while in terms of like its assembly. I mean, we could go ahead and put the, uh, the thermostat housing on, um, maybe some of these ancillary items down here, but really what we're waiting for is the ability to mate the gearbox to this. Now, uh, if you haven't been following my gearbox videos, we still need to set up the idler shim on the gearbox and then that'll actually be ready to mate to this. And then the engine's actually basically gonna be ready to sell. All right, so now that we have the gearbox and the engine painted, we're gonna move on to what's called the idler gear end float. Now this is something that for whatever reason is super frequently overlooked when people are working on their own cars and it's something that is super important. This being out of whack can cause all sorts of problems, but let me show you guys how to set this. First things first, you take your shims and your idler gear, so you should have two shims, one on each side, just like this. Mount that right there into your gearbox casing, and then you're gonna take your whole cover here and you're gonna install this. Now, this needs to be installed with the gasket on and should pop in there pretty tight. Now, I've already measured mine, but what you're gonna have to do is, is install the bolts that go into all the bolt holes that you can actually get to. Um, the reason you need to do that is you need to sandwich this down so you can get a correct reading. Rotating this around, you can see here that we have the idler gear, we have access to it. Normally the engine's sitting right here and you don't have access to it um, if you were to reassemble this with, uh, without doing this first. Now, to measure this, there's two different ways you can do this. You can use a DTI gauge, which is this gauge right here, or you can use the feeler gauge method. Now, I am gonna show you guys the feeler gauge method because this is what most people are gonna have. This is probably gonna be the easiest thing for you to do. And now what you need to do with this sandwich down, and, you'll, and you see this gasket right here is gonna create a certain amount of clearance, um, but with that sandwich down, you can take your feeler gauge and stick it in between the shim and the actual casing of your gearbox. And that is gonna give you your reading. So you're gonna keep testing out different feeler gauges until you know how thick it is and how much out of clearance it is. And then the easiest thing to do is to do a little bit of math. So in my case, I was 15 thou out. So that's 0 0.015 inches out. And so what that means is that I need to get two new shims um, that are gonna take up that slack. You can get one shim to take up all the slack, but personally, I like to I like to split the difference on this. So to do that, you're gonna need a, uh, a measurement gauge here. So let me take this back off. So you zero this out, and then you take your shit, and you take your washer, stick it in there, squeeze it together, and it'll give you your reading. Now, I'm not doing a very good job of holding this steady right now, but um, what it's gonna give you is the base reading. And so you'll measure each one of these washers. So you measure both sides, add those together, take your clearance, add that, and then divide everything by two. And what that's gonna give you is the correct size shim for each side um, that you'll need to purchase from, the, from your mini parts supplier. Now these are not difficult to get, so don't worry. These aren't like super hard to find. Um, these are produced now and you can get them. Um, so I have my new shims, my new washers, that have the clearance taken up in them. And what you should do when you get these is just double check the clearance, 
with your measurement gauge, with your electronic gauge, then add a little bit of assembly lubrication to these. And then once that's all lubed up, you can rotate this back around so you can see it. Once that's all lubed up and everything, we're gonna put the cover back on. So just so you guys are aware, what we're looking for is 0 .004 inches of clearance and that is going to provide enough space for it to expand but it's also going to keep it tight so it won't have any sort of seizing issues now as you can see here i'm going to reinstall this and we're going to go ahead put some screws in here tighten this sucker up and then we're going to test that shim one more time Now, first things first, just go ahead and test to see if it is uh, binding or anything. After tightening these down, and as you can see, there's no binding, which is awesome. Um, so now we need to stick our feeler gauge in there and see if our new shims take up the slack that we're hoping for to bring us to that 0.004 uh, degrees of clearance. And that is a perfect, perfect setting. Um, this is not a surprise though, because we did lots of math to figure this out, but very exciting stuff, and what that means is that we can start putting this back together. We can finally put the gearbox back on the engine. So let's jump over to the engine stand. It's finally time to do this job. Now, before I put the gearbox in, I am gonna do this one more time. I'm gonna add a bunch of assembly lubrication to the camshaft. This has been sitting for just a little while, and there's no sense in risking it. I want that thing to be really lubed up when it starts up the first time. But what we're gonna do is set our gasket in right here, this rubber gasket, that needs to get placed in. And I strongly recommend using a ton of gasket sealer right here, because this is a very frequent point of leakage. And then of course, we're gonna clean up the surface all the way around here, and we're gonna install the gearbox right on top. You can see we have two posts in here that are gonna help align the gearbox. Now, one thing that is very confusing for a lot of people is this gasket right here. Now the flat side goes towards your timing cover. So it goes in just like this. One thing I recommend doing here is put a fork load of uh, rubber gasket sealer or um, the ultra black gasket sealer. Put that on here before this goes on. Go ahead and set it into place so that it's just right. And then, and then, put your gaskets on, and then lower your gearbox onto this. So gaskets go on with their gasket sealer. This goes on, squishes down in there with all that Permatex on it, like that. And then the gearbox comes down and gets bolted into place. Um, that is going to provide you the best seal. Um, so just to keep that in mind, that's a lot of experience telling you that that this is the best way to do this. Um, it's my opinion. There are also gaskets that many spare cells that are rigid, they're uh, like this, but they're rigid. Um, and uh, those are awesome, um, but they're a little bit more expensive. You decide whether it's worth it to you or not. Now don't forget on your gearbox side, you're gonna wanna add this little O-ring right here. A lot of people forget this, it's extremely important. This O-ring obviously helps seal this, so don't forget that. Okay, so the last thing that we're gonna be doing tonight is putting the end, the whole, uh, the whole bell housing, everything on the end here. Um, I'm really, really excited about this. Um, as you can see, we got our primary gear installed. Um, before we put this cover on, we are gonna need to reinstall our idler gear with the two new washers on it. That's looking good. And as you can see, we have engagement between the crank and the gearbox now, which is super exciting stuff. Um, so we have our, uh, so we have the main shaft coming out of our gearbox right here with our idler gear and our primary gear. But let's get our gasket ready. We're gonna get that um, all gasket sealed up and then we're gonna press this on here, tighten this whole sucker down. 
And then the engine at that point will be largely covered up and complete, which is super, super exciting stuff. Um, and this is gonna be the last thing that we're gonna do tonight. The next episode is where I'm going to unveil the engine as it's finished. And at that time, the engine will be hitting the market. So if you wanna buy this early 998 for a uh, full nut and bolt restoration you're looking to do, this will be ready and up for sale. Okay, so this is mounted on. Now, some of you might notice that I did not use the original locking tabs on these. And that is because they're not as reliable as these locking washers. I learned this trick from a few people who build these engines regularly. Um, they say not to use those lock tabs, so I'm gonna trust them. Um, and, uh, and I'm not using them here either. Um, you can see they're all grade eight bolts, so they're really strong, gonna hold this sucker on here. And as you can see, the engine is largely put back together now, which is pretty exciting stuff. Um, one thing that I'm not gonna cover in this video is putting the clutch back in. I've covered that a few times on my own engine and it's just, uh, I don't wanna go over it again if I'm honest with you guys. But if you're looking for that, just head back through my videos, you'll find it there. Otherwise, when we get back on the next episode, the cover will be here and we'll uh, button up all the final ancillary items that are on the engine and we'll list it for sale. So thanks so much for joining. Uh -huh.